This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. This is Ray Sobs from the NX Network, and you're listening to Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on the X. You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Shifts channel and on the X, the new mainstream at KUNX Digital Broadcasting Talk Radio. Are you ready for this? Because we are about to embark on an hour and a half of UFO shenanigans and paranormal adventures. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red tic tac instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality of the UFO mystery. All of these shows are great primers. And in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. For those listening on KUNX Talk Radio and affiliates, I have two other shows each week that only air on my YouTube channel. Mysteries with a History is live this Thursday at 1 p.m. PST instead of 2.30 p.m. this week only. The show is done with my co-host, Jimmy Church of Fade and Black Radio, and this week will be the Mysteries of India. There is no strange paradigms this week only. But for my new viewers and listeners, the live show Strange Paradigms is where I cover all the strange weekly news and mysterious headlines from around the world. So definitely check out my website at strangeparadigms.com for all show archives, more information, and direct video links to my channel. Oh, and make sure to hit the notification bell on YouTube. Quick news, the Artemis 1 mission that will take mannequins to orbit the moon did not launch on August 29th. The mission has been postponed after the team was unable to work through an issue with one of the rocket's four engines. If a substantial fix is needed, the team may require more time to address it and roll the rocket back into the Kennedy Space Center's Vehicle Assembly Building, a process that takes three and a half days. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson addressed the scrub shortly after it was announced, stressing that Artemis 1 is a test flight. He said, We don't launch until it's right. They've got a problem with the gases going on the engine bleed on one engine. It's just illustrated that this is a very complicated machine, a very complicated system, and all those things have to work. You don't light the candle until it's ready to go. The next launch date will be either September 2nd or September 5th if the weather permits. So all we can do is wait and see on what happens next. Now, let me talk about my guest. John Burroughs is currently retired from the Air Force Reserves, entering the USAF in 1979 and served 27 years, both in active and reserve duty. John had various assignments throughout his Air Force career. Some of these assignments were at Luke, Osun, Grissom, and Castle Air Force Base, with reserve assignments at Davis, Monthan, Williams, Reese, and Luke Air Force Base as a IMA. 
He also has been tasked on several occasions with his canine to provide protection for the President of the United States for the United States Secret Service. The most notable assignment began in 1979, where he was assigned as a security police law enforcement patrolman at Royal Air Force Base Bentwaters in England. There, he had a life-changing event where he conducted an investigation on a phenomenon which has left the rest of the world in awe of the most documented and witnessed sighting by the United States military in known history. Let's bring him in. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm, Mr. Burroughs. Thank you for being here. How's it going? It's going good, and thanks for having me. You are rather famous in the UFO community, but for my younger viewers and listeners that may not be familiar with you and your story, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I, I don't necessarily agree with famous, but I was involved in an incident. It's over 40 years old. It still sticks around to this day because of the different things that went on with us during the incident and after the incident. Uh, a background on me is I spent 27 years in the United States Air Force. The incident took place on my first assignment. It was on Aria Bent Waters in England. It happened on in December of 1980. We were on duty. It was our last midnight shift. It was about three o'clock in the morning. We came on at 11. And so we came on it as Christmas was ending and we went into Boxing Day over in the UK. So it was about three o'clock in the morning when I was riding around with my supervisor and he saw something strange in the sky going into the forest. He got my attention to look to see what he was seeing. He asked me if, uh, if I'd ever seen anything like that. I'd been there over a year and a half and I said no. So at that point we decided we we better take a closer look before we say anything. So we went ahead and opened up the back gate. It was the East gate. It was on Woodbridge base. It was the, it was the twin bases, the Bentwaters and Woodbridge. We uh, drove down. There was a road that left the gate all the way down to a T where you could go left the Bentwaters right to a small village. I don't remember the name of it now. And but right there at the end of the road is where the forest was. It started. And that's where the, you could see the lights. So kind of did a U-turn at the T. Um, so the car was the door where I was on facing getting out. I got out and immediately when I opened the door, it felt weird. There was like a static electricity in the air. Things just didn't seem right. And I don't want to say we felt like we were in danger, like severe danger, but because we were off base, hadn't told anybody and something weird was seemed to be going on. We, we got back up to the gate right away and called it in. From that point, they didn't really believe us. It was Christmas night. The desk sergeant thought we were pulling a joke on him. It was pretty laid back that night anyway. They were playing music on one of the frequencies, Christmas music. But we persisted, so he transferred us to CSC, and at that point, we filled them in, or Sergeant Stephens did at that point. They put me back They put me back on the phone. I added some more things that we were seeing. They sent a security patrol down to the uh, gate to verify what we were seeing. Uh, he saw it, too. They saw it, too. So at that point, there was a discussion being made at CSC with the shift commander and the on-duty security flight chief, what we should do to include, they contacted the local radar. They contacted our radar, RAPCON. They also contacted Eastern Radar, who then also contacted Heathrow. And on radar, there had been some kind of object or some kind of bogey or whatever you want to call it. People call it different things. There was a blip on the radar that was over the area at one point, and it disappeared into the forest. Based on that, because it was really, really, I guess the word I want to use is there was a real fine line on when we, how and when we could go off base. If there was a direct threat to the perimeter of the base, then we could obviously respond to it. But this was in the forest off base. 
So it was really a fine line if we could, but because of the radar contact, a decision was made to send us out into the forest to see if possibly an aircraft had went down. Uh, three of us went out, the, the security patrol and his rider and I were went ahead and went out. The uh, Sergeant Steph as my supervisor stayed up at the gate to maintain the gate and, and watch the weapons because we, we went into the forest unarmed. Uh, we went out down a service road. We got so far we couldn't go any farther. We got out. We climbed over a fence. You can see the lights in the forest. People always ask me what they look like. To me, I've always said they looked like like a, like a Christmas light display. There was different colors like red, green, blue. There was a, a bigger, like a light kind of, it, it seemed like they were in it almost like a reddish, orangish hue. Um, we proceeded towards it. At one point, it, we might have even felt like we went past it. But eventually, after going through the woods for several minutes, we came to like a berm area. And as we came up to the top of the berm, whatever it was was in front of us. The um, It got really bright. We all hit the ground. And then what I and the other guy that was with me one of the other guys that was with me, remember, was it got really bright, then it dimmed, and then it took off. It just, you know, bright. When we saw it, it dimmed down, and it got it kind of got brighter again. Then it went up into the trees and departed. The other individual with me has gone on the record saying that he walked around it, touched it, saw gliss on it, had a download. So, but the two of us... Kabansak and I, we don't remember any of that. Um, we just remember getting close to it. From that point, it, we, it went out, whatever it was, headed for the kind of went out towards the coast. We received permission to go farther out. So we crossed another fence into a farmer's field. And what's led to some cottages along the road was where we kind of saw it down there. We got to there and it was it wasn't there when we got there. And it seemed to be out in the distance further again. And eventually we got, I don't know, basically at the time I didn't know, but now I've went back and walked it afterwards, years later. It was like a couple of miles. We went all the way out to the coast. And at that point, when we got to the coast, all we could see was a lighthouse beacon going around um, and the coast itself. But beforehand, you know, whatever it was, it's hard to describe. People call it an object. I call it like a different colored lights. And the Rendlesham incident was an encounter that you didn't go through alone. What was it like to have other people cooperate with your story? Well, that's some of the problem. I mean, it's, first of all, the story didn't get out for, was it three or four years? And the base itself had actually, the command level had kind of implied, we want to know what you saw. We'll take care of it. If we have any questions, we'll get back to you. But otherwise, leave it alone. So because I wasn't directly dealing with them, I was there when we were talked to, but the, uh, the staff sergeant was the one doing most of the talking. It was pretty much implied that we just left it alone. It was like, being classified. Um, so, but what we remembered and recounted was different. So that's caused problems over the years in itself with people wanting to believe what happened to us. What do you want people to know about the Rendlesham encounter that maybe is not typically spoken about? Well, the incident took place. It really happened. It wasn't the lighthouse, which that was the initial early on explanation they tried to give that we were fooled by the lighthouse. Not just one night, but three nights, because there was stuff that took place three nights in a row. And we got real close to something both I did both night one and three. And it wasn't the lighthouse. The um it affected people's lives, health-wise. Um, 
it disrupted our lives and our career somewhat. And what I mean by that, it was, it didn't ruin our careers, but like for me, it got, the story got mixed up where they will supposedly some people over the three night period that were involved, got orders out of there right away. They left, including one of the shift commanders that had an encounter on night two. That's been, I've never confirmed it, but it's been confirmed by different people that she, and I don't remember her being there after that incident. So she left, but I, I finished my tour, but when the story broke to the news of the world, and it be started becoming a hot topic and CNN got involved. Several of us, myself, Colonel Hall, and uh, Colonel Williams, who was then a general, got moved over to PACAF where they could hide us. So that disrupted my life and my where I was going with my life and my career and my future. Um, I also got severely sick from it and it's caused health issues. Um, it got to the point where we can go into this later a little bit more, but they lied and they denied I was even in the Air Force when the event took place. My medical records are classified. Um, my DD Form 214 that was used was not the DD 1414 that showed me being in the Air Force to include the fact the Air Force even at one point denied I was in directly through FRPC. Um, other people that were involved have health issues that haven't been able to get the care that I have because I had a lot of power behind me to include another individual was me on night three that also got disability and care. So it's a big toxic mess to include the fact that when the story first broke, it was misled because the memo that was released wasn't factual itself. You touched on a lot of things that we are going to get into, but a, just a little moment ago, you said that they tried to hide you. Why did they do that? Well, see... <laughs> Like I said, when I was an airman, first tour, when it happened, we, when we left the field the first night, we just were in awe of what happened, and we had no explanation to even try to explain it. So for me, being as that I was the lower man on the totem pole, I didn't have to answer for it anyway. And then when we saw our chain of command, they didn't seem like we what they wanted us to talk about it. So, and after it happened for me, it just died down. So I kind of just left it alone. And I went on my way. I got my next assignment, went there. I ended up going with somebody else that was stationed with me at the time. And I didn't say a word about it. And he ran his mouth to some people. And then everybody started asking me questions. So that was assignment two. I got my third assignment, which was in Arizona. And when I was there one day, the phone started ringing and there were different people all around the world calling me about the incident. And I was kind of like, whoa, it's taking this long for it to get out, number one. But number two, no, I'm not going to talk about it. I don't even know how it got out, and what's going on. Well, then one of the bigger phone calls I got, which got my attention, was a guy by the name of Chuck DeCarl for CNN who did a special assignments report. And when he called me, I actually took his call. Most of the people I just said, I don't know how you got my number. Why are you bothering me? But I have no interest in talking to you. Please leave me alone. But they didn't. They kept calling me. But DeCaro, I listened to because he was mainstream press. And he basically told me that he was tasked through CNN, through the Pentagon to talk to me and that he was coming out. And I said, well, I'm not going to talk to you. And he says, yeah, you will. So not only will you, I will be at your doorstep every day and at the base every day until you do. So at that point, I went to the base that afternoon to go on duty, and I notified public affairs what was going on. It was really tough to explain it because the, the officer in charge wasn't there. There was a, uh, an NCO there that was like the clerk or whatever you want to say. And I just said simply, I've been contacted by CNN. They want to interview me about an incident that took place in 1980 at this base. Um, please contact the Pentagon and find out what they want me to do. So I went to work. Nothing happened. Went home. Next day came to work. As I was drawing, my flight chief came flying out the door. The door comes banging open. It was, get up to the battle staff now. The commander's on the line with the Pentagon. And I'm like, what? So I go down the hall. Everybody's looking at me. I go into the battle staff area. He's on a secure line. He's looking at me. 
and he puts it on hold for a second and he goes, what's going on? I says, sir, until I take the phone call, I can't tell you anything. So I got on the line. It was a general at the Pentagon and there was a shift commander that was at the Bentwaters at the time by the name of Captain Graham, who was now assigned to public affairs at the Pentagon. They basically read me what had happened, what was taking place. There was a memo released that there were some people talking um, and that that the Air Force didn't want to make it look like a total cover-up. So they couldn't deny it happened because of the memo being released, but that I was to speak with CNN and I was to follow the memo. And I said, well, it would be nice if I saw the memo before I spoke with them. And they said, no, that, you know, that was not the time today's world where they could have sent it to me in a PDF. They said, when he gets, when you get to him, look at the memo and just agree with the memo. And then they also said there was a guy by the name of Larry Warren running his mouth that was saying things that weren't true. Graham talked more about that. And I said, look, at this point, I don't really want to talk about it. I haven't seen the memo. I don't, I'm not wanting to talk about it because what if I don't agree with what, what's being presented? And the general just reminded me who he was and how it could affect my career. And I would I take the meeting. So I agreed. My commander was sitting outside the secure area looking at me. And I just said, well, you know, I got a major here that wants some answers. Can, can you talk to him? He said, yeah, put him on the phone. So he got briefed. I went to work. But shortly after all that started, I got orders for Korea and I wasn't even due. And the, 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 to the get to the final point was after they aired the special assignment report, which they submitted a copy to the Pentagon who sent it to Korea, I had to go into public affairs, sit and review it with OSI. Um, CNN requested a follow-up interview with me to get my reaction to it, and they were denied access into Korea or into the into the well Korea where Halt and I were, and to talk to Williams about it. So they didn't really want us out there talking about something that could take off on its own life. So what was it like for you being in the limelight? I just never looked at it as the limelight. I um, I just looked at it as that it was a pain in the ass. I mean, sorry, but it was. I, I couldn't give them, I couldn't really talk about it. Never mind the fact I couldn't really explain it anyway at that point in my life, really understanding what it was. And I didn't see any benefit from doing anything with it or talking about it just because of the fact that what was the end game, you know? And it was clear the military had to say it happened because there was enough evidence to support that, but they really didn't want to talk about. I mean, over the years when they seemed to loosen up a little bit, let us talk about it. I talked about it more only to straighten out my part of what happened to me because there were rumors everywhere about what could have happened to me, what I was involved with and what went down. And I definitely wanted to straighten that part out. Of course. And rumors spread like wildfire. Once it starts, it's really hard to stop it. So did the encounter ruin your life, change it permanently or enhance it? I wouldn't say it didn't ruin my life because I'm still here, but it, it caused me severe medical problems. So that I'm dealing with today, I'm only in my early 60s and, you know, I've got the heart of an 80 year old. So and it's been very stressful, especially after I got sick. Never mind all the people that showed up. <laughs> yeah, you would believe it 30 years later, the, the, how the government showed all of a sudden renewed interest in this. So, Why is that? Why was there this sense of renewed interest in your story? Well, there's a lot of possibilities, but what happened was we did, we did a, a, a panel like, Steve Bassett did a, a, a mock con congressional um, inquiry into UFOs and we were invited to speak and we did. And what had happened right before we went up there was the military or the DOD, I guess you could say, not the Air Force itself was involved with it, were denying my, that I was in the Air Force. They were denying me access to my medical records so the doctors could treat me properly and had all the evidence to support that because there was a senator by the name of Kyle that had started with this and, and had all the letters and documentation showing that they were being stonewalled and everything was being covered up, including a letter 
from Kyle's from Kyle saying my records are classified, my medical records are classified. Then he retired and kicked it over to McCain. And McCain started getting into it. And that's when they did a physical on me to rate me for disability and how to move forward. And the doctor I met with said, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this because according to the Air Force, you weren't even in when you claim what happened happened to you. And I'm looking at her like, what? And I show her some documents showing I was. And she says, well, all I can tell you is what I've got. And what I've got shows you're not in. So I'm going to have to write it up as such. So I got denied being in. And what was interesting was when they denied it, they they actually lied to a United States senator. We requested FOIA, and they withheld most of the documents, and they wouldn't release them. They wouldn't admit there was a classified record section, even though we had documents supporting that there was a classified record section. Um, it just went down the line, and they wouldn't even answer our FOIAs. So that was the original stonewall that both Kyle and McCain got on what happened to us. So, you know, that made it hard. And in between, I ended up having to have some procedures done on my heart that weren't necessary if the true information would have come out. But when we did our presentation, um, I'm not trying to sound arrogant, but, and it's not that other things in that, that conference over those, what, three or four days weren't important, but this one stuck because it involved military people that, there you had an, an incident took place and there was a cover up taking place. Right. And so the people on the panel wrote a letter to the VA and to President Obama that something needed to be done. And that drew in some of the government people that started looking closely at my health issues and my problems. And that was just another whole, that almost was crazier than being out in that field seeing what was happening. All the different things and twists and turns that have happened since that. It, it seems that way. And I have a few more questions on that matter in particular, but we are coming towards a break. Hang tight. We'll be right back. gigawatt paranormal powerhouse kunx db bx this is micah hanks of the micah hanks program right here on kunx and right now you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only christina gomez For alternative talk radio on the internet, the X. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend Christina Gomez on Shifting the Paradigm. Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the unxnetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UNX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. 
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Explaining the unexplained. The new unxnetwork.com. Hi, hi. This is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new Unex Network. And you're locked on Shifting the, the paradigm. paradigm with the intrepid Christina, Christina Gomez, Gomez on, on the X. The X. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Welcome back. With me today is John Burroughs, and we were talking about practically the process of obtaining or attempting to obtain your medical records. Today, do you have them in hand? No, no they're still classified. In fact, um, the DOD was involved with my surgery, and they kept all my because there was something else going on besides but I'll get into that in a second, but they kept all my tissue and everything. It was all bagged and tagged like evidence. Um, and it was handled by a different doctor other than my surgeon. And they also drew blood for DNA analysis. And that was one of the things that had happened prior to me getting my surgery was a guy that had been in the CIA showed up and he actually was probably involved in the incident back when it happened. Um, how how deep is still unknown other than he admitted that he was involved with the memo being released as far as being drafted and released to the British. So he showed up. He's a doctor. Um, there was interest in my DNA and an MRI scan of my brain because of the encounter that had happened with the UAPs that they call it now. Um, and then the DOD, he actually, because that they were dragging their feet so much, we were working on a federal lawsuit with my attorney to actually force their hand on why my records were classified. He was going to be involved with that. But he kicked it forward by writing a letter that is not classified to, um, to the DOD VA on what to look for and how to deal with it. And so then I got the surgery through the VA and the DOD and they uh, got all the tissue from my injuries. They got my blood. They did a DNA analysis and everything else at that time. An encounter like yours without a shadow of a doubt modifies the way you see the world and the universe. You were witness to a monumental event, a fixed point in history. Can you share with us your vision of reality now? <laughs> That's a tough one just because a lot of what's taking place in the world's crazy today. And I, I don't think it has much to do with what happened to us or the implications of what it could be. Um, the one thing I can tell you is that 
what is happening with what they now call UAPs is no different than what's happening, period. They're never going to tell you the truth and they're always going to keep it stuck. They're always going to keep it stirred up and um, keep people guessing and keep things confusing. Um, and so based on my 27 years in the military, what happened with this incident itself, all the stuff that took place after the incident and some of the other things that I know about, it's I don't have a, a great picture of the world. As far as not the people in it, it's the people that are put in charge of it. To be a little more specific, how has your encounter changed your worldview in, in the greater sense? God, aliens, the the big questions, etc. Well, OK, that's even a rougher question to answer. I did hypnosis. Some really strange stuff came out. Um, this is back in 88. Um, I, I've always believed in God or I, I've had always a tendency just to believe in like a superior being. I mean, man named, called him God. Um, they, they did all that manipulation back way back in the council of Nicaea, where they took that issue and were able to, I guess you could call it almost politicize it way back then, as far as how to control people. Um, as far as are we alone, I don't think we are. But the biggest question is, is why is whatever we're doing with playing cat and mouse? Because it is. I mean, and there's some there's some possibilities of why that's happening um, that I've looked at and I've had the ability to talk to some people behind the scenes that are high up in the science world. Um, but so there's something going on. Um, we're definitely advancing technology-wise faster than I think we are capable of doing by ourselves. So the big question is, is what's the end game? Um, how does it affect the little guys like us, not so much the elite? So that's concerning to me and how they use everything to their advantage. The hypnosis session you mentioned, this fascinates me. Can you tell us about your session in 1988, eight years after the encounter? Did it open unwanted unwanted doors in your memory? Or did you want to remember what happened to you those nights? Well, I could, we could do an interview for eight hours, 10 hours of all the crazy stuff that's happened. So I'll try to summarize this quickly. Um, back in 1988, they were going to do a, um, they did a piece called, um, what was it? Uh, God, no, I just had a senior moment, but it was a, it was a show they did live on TV, UFO cover up live. And they, I just gotten out of active duty and was in the reserves and they contacted me and they brought me out to LA to meet with some high power people, including in the government that they were supposedly going to move forward with trying to get some of this out. And Reynoldson was a case they wanted to discuss in this live TV show with Mike Farrell that hosted it. Um, met with the executive producer, Kurt Brubaker, who was an engineer on the side, had his own engineering company in LA. And the first thing he did, it seemed to me like he was more interested in Ben Waters for the technology part of it, not Ben Waters itself. But long story short, we met the producer. He came out. Uh, after we were done with all that, Brubaker took me aside and he said he's going to have Bentwaters pulled. And one of the things that was going on with me was I couldn't remember really what happened when we got close to it, when I got close to it on the first night. And the third night was taboo because Halt was denying I was even out there on the third night. So no one would even believe me that I, I was out there at that point. But evidence came forward later to support what I said. So what he asked me to do was go under hypnosis to see what I could remember. Yeah, I was a little um, nervous about it because I didn't know what was going to spew out because hypnosis isn't, people, a lot of people don't believe in it or feel it's that reliable anyway. But I went forward with it. It was a very, very strange um, session. Um, different people inside the intelligence agencies have reviewed it. They uh, stated, and this is why I just have a hard time with all this, that when I'll state this, this came from people in positions of, you know, authority or the know that have said things in 
different things that are kind of hard to believe myself. But they actually said during the hypnosis, I was communicating with the phenomenon. And that it went into what we were dealing with, what it was, you know, and why it was there, that it would probably be back for me again later. Um, and that, that whatever it was, most likely could have been, and I say this most likely because it wasn't a definitive response, but it looked like it could be something from the future coming back that how we evolved. Can you go into more detail on that? Because I'm aware that during that session, do you have those tape recordings with you or is that just what you've been told about that? that no, no, I, I, no, I have the hypnosis and I really did a good job of tying it up legally when it was done and it's never seen the light of day other than there's like two or three short clips that are out there on YouTube or were that when I work with Linda Moulton Howe, when we did some presentations, we... Uh, showed a couple of the clips of what came out under hypnosis. But yeah, I still have the full hypnosis tape from 88. And then one that was done later on, that was also very bizarre. Jim Penniston, the man that also witnessed this encounter, believes that the craft is connected to humans from the future, kind of like what you said. What do you think about this aspect? And has your opinion changed over time? Well, see, that's where I'm going to tell you this. Um, I've known Penniston and been around him quite a bit over the years. Now, that opinion that he came out with, if you go back and research it, he came out after he did hypnosis. And when he first started talking about it after the hypnosis, he was still leery about, or he kept it separate from what he thought before the hypnosis and even after what he remembered other than the hypnosis. But now he's to the point now where he just flat out just says they are us from the future. I can just tell you that I don't know exactly what it is, um, but we encountered something. It affected me physically and that my hypnosis says in a roundabout way, not a direct way, that whatever it is is what we, how we've evolved and it's back observing us. It was something along the lines of like, we're not sure who, if you're related to us or not, or something like that. And we're here observing to find out. So it wasn't a direct, you know, us from the future. But then this is the other thing that came out that it also implied that it could actually have been one of the things I encountered was me from the future. It was my energy or consciousness from the future. Being by Jim Penniston's side for 40 years, what lets him think that it's us from the future? I, I can't answer that. I mean, like I said, if you go back and look at his interviews and what he did over the years, he changed a lot after he did that hypnosis. So I, I can't answer why he believes what he believes now or why he uh, why it took so long for the notebook to surface in the first place then the codes afterwards, um, and a lot of stuff that went on. I just know that I was with him the first night. We went out there. We had something happen to us. And I personally, and I get attacked for this sometimes, like by people saying, well, you're a lame witness because you can't explain exactly what it was or what you saw. And I'm like, whatever, dude. I'm just going to tell you what I remember. You know, and I do believe based on, what happened to us both nights, what happened to me both nights, what people saw happen to me both nights, and the interest that's been from the government since to include my injuries, that we encountered something. So where it's from and what its intentions are, I, I still can't tell you overall. You commented about you from the future and references to time keep popping up in your interviews in the past and here also. How sure are you on a scale of one to 10 that it's us from the future as opposed to aliens from other worlds? Probably, I, I you'd have to say one because again, I, I don't have the data that some claim they do, some of the people that have investigated whatever this phenomenon is. Um, and 
I can only tell you, and that's why I've been very careful of separating what I remember and what came out under hypnosis, you know, and even the second time when we tried to go deeper into it, at that point, there was a block, but there was some kind of force inside when they initially tried to take me in that appeared and blocked me from going into remembering, you know, under hypnosis, what took place. And at one point it was like, I almost came off the, the, the couch. I was almost lifting off the couch. Can you go into detail on that? How, how is that even possible? Um, it was a scene where she said, go to the door and open it. And then I did. And then there was like a circular motion going play like a, like a, I don't, I don't want to like, you could almost say like a, um, I don't know, vortex or something if you're like, and there were blue lights in front of me. And then I started go to feel like I was going in it. And then the face appeared and I said, I can't go forward any further. And I was shaking. My whole body was shaking. And I was like levitating off the couch. And she told me I could, I was safe. And I go, no, I'm not. And, and so it was, it was, it was freaky. I mean, I, some reason I was blocked from even going back and remember any of what I talked about the first time. So after all of these years later, do you feel like your encounter was hostile or something else? Well, you get all these experts coming on and saying, some people saying, Oh no, if you're injured, you're, it's hostile. You've got other ones saying like, well, if you didn't know what a microwave was and you stuck your hand in there, what would happen? Or you didn't know, what could happen behind the jet engine. So the the thing is that if you want to believe what could have happened to us, me, especially on the second night, the third night, actually the third night, my second encounter was the, the guy that was with me, who's also gotten disability and treatment and hacks. He got, went into it a little bit, saw me disappear and then phase back later. Um, it's, but I don't remember that. I remember getting close to it and that's it. And it was what he saw where he was behind me as it came over me. And then basically, I think part of his hand went into it where he's had injury. He has issues with his hand. Um, is, is that I don't know what his intent was. Um, I can, we can go into a little bit of about the research I did with some other people over the years about what our government was doing over there right outside the back gate to the possibility of the phenomenon and what was taking place. But again, it's really hard to say if it had intent on hurting us or hurting me or anybody else, it, or if it was just our bodies weren't capable of dealing with what we interacted with. Well, your bodies really did go through an extensive amount of trauma. And in an interview with the famous Art Bell on Coast to Coast AM, you had mentioned that the CIA kept you alive. What did you mean by that? Well, that's what I was saying about a guy that was in the CIA at the time of the event. Um, after we did the, um, the Bassett conference, he showed up. He contacted him the lawyer, my lawyer, met with him in Jackson, gave him a full brief, then flew out, flew my lawyer and his wife, who's also a lawyer and a nurse, out to Sedona, where I lived at the time, and met with me, did a full physical, and that's when he presented us with what they were looking at and how um, they wanted to study the injuries that people like I had, um, you know, had happened to us they were doing, a, I think it was 100 people that they, they had confirmed had encounters. And don't ask me how they knew that. I'm just telling you, he said, there was 100 people that were going to be put in this study that they had confirmed had encounters. He did say to us that the majority of these, no one even knew about who they were because most of them weren't like what happened to us. It slipped through the cracks and got leaked out and shouldn't have. Um, and... He, they were evaluating the effects on our body and our minds. So I refused to do any of it um, because I was in the middle of the fight with the government and self anyway. 
And even though he wasn't directly in, in the CIA anymore, he was a contractor for the CIA, the DIA, and a couple other alphabet soup agencies. So um, I declined. And that's when he came back a few days later and wrote a letter that was later classified once I presented it to the government that um, that moved forward all my treatment and everything else. Now, back in 2015, Colonel Charles Halt revealed he had obtained written statements from radar operators, which corroborated the UFO encounters with actual captures of objects on radar screen. Have you seen those statements or read their content? And if so, how has it helped your cause and your desire to get the truth out to the public? Well, there's a big discrepancy with that, too. Okay, for for starters... Halt kind of poo-pooed the fact that the first night we went out there because of radar contact, but we did. Because, you know, the shift commander popped up years later on a site and tried to downplay what Penniston, especially what Penniston said he remembered happening. And I just challenged him and I said, well, why did you send us out there in the first place? Um, Because other than we had radar contact with something that disappeared. And he immediately excused himself from the conversation and wouldn't go any further with it. So we would never have gone out there that night if there hadn't been some evidence on radar saying something was there. It wasn't just enough to see some strange lights out there um, that weren't, you know, they were probably at the closest, whatever it was, was maybe a quarter to a half mile away from the back gate in the fence line. But the lights were closer, the you know lights coming off of it. But there wasn't a total reason for us to go out there um, unless the British showed up and investigated and requested us. So that's why we went out there. Now, the interesting thing with Hall is, is that on night three, uh, I think it was Nick Redfern got a, a FOIA from the British government meeting at 0320 that our, our command post contacted Eastern Radar and wanted to know if there's anything on radar in our location. And I believe if I remember right, they said, no, there wasn't anything on radar. So there's always been a kind of a, a a back and forth on what night radar contact was, but there was no doubt. We were told that on night one, that's why we got to go out there in the first place. Thank you for clearing that out. Now, in recent years, have you had individuals approach you with similar experiences from within the military? And if so, without revealing anything sensitive or private about those individuals, can you share some of those more cooperative stories that have been passed on to you? Well, nothing that I, when I was in, you know, active duty reserves and then reactivated on active duty uh, for Bosnia and then 9-11. Nothing that was similar overall to what happened to us, other than there was two or three or four people that were at classified locations that had strange lights show up. And there was a couple people that were in an aircraft that had seen some strange things from the airplane itself. But nothing like anybody coming up and saying they got close to something or anything or it, you know, affected the resources or anything like that. In a witness statement, you said that quote, the woods lit up and you could hear the farm animals making a lot of noises. Can you talk about that? Like were the noises the animals made sounded agitated in your opinion or more like absolute distress? Um, it was it was probably a fine line between agitated and distressed. They were like, it wasn't normal. I mean, when I was out there on night three, it wasn't like that. So it wasn't a normal thing. And you got to remember, I'd never been out there in that area prior to the event. Um, so I can't tell you, you know, if they act like that for other things. But they were clearly highly agitated and worked up when we went out there and when we got close to it is when you could hear them and then the light, the whole woods lit up. So the whole thing was just really, you know, freaky or spooky or however you want. It wasn't something you would normally used to have happen to you. How close were the lights to the farmhouse? 
Well, when it went up out of the forest area where we were before it went went into the field and towards the see that's another thing that's been misleading. That wasn't the farmer's house for the fields. Those were cottages down there. And the reason why I know that is when I went back over there with the film crew, we went down to all those houses and we're talking to some of the people. A couple of people still were, lived there when the event happened. And the farmer that owned that area and stuff, his house was several miles away. So those were cottages that people lived in. So it was right there, right there where, right there between the two of the cottages. And also the finger of trees that were down there by that, there was weird lights in them. So also. You said that you spoke to some of the people in those cottages. Did any of them witness the lights? <laughs> the British people fall under the Secrets Act. And I don't know how seriously the young people take it, but the older people do. And one of the stories was one of the houses, the cottages there, uh, the guy or the family there worked the fields for the, the people that owned the farm, and they were moved pretty quickly. And so the people that we did speak to that said they were there when it happened said they heard some strange noises and military people out there, but that's as far as they wanted to go. They didn't really want to go into it. And this wasn't me talking to them. This was the film crew that, you know, we went down there and asked permission to set up there to film some stuff. And then they decided to go from house to house or cottage to cottage just to see if anybody was there or knew somebody that was there or knew some stuff. And they were pretty reserved. They didn't want to talk much about it. That's very interesting. And that seems to be a reoccurring theme in some of the smaller towns when they encounter something incredibly weird. John, we are coming towards another break. We'll be right back. gigawatt paranormal powerhouse KUNX DB BX This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm Thank all of you for listening to The X. But did you know you can watch live streaming video and catch your favorite video casts on the Unex Network YouTube channel? Wow, you mean I can watch The X shows anytime? That's right. Watch any show anytime, even binge watch your favorite programs. Which shows are on the Unex Network YouTube channel? You can watch Most Haunted with Dan Terry, Entity Voices, Paranormal Evidence, Paranormally Blonde, and Unexplained Phenomena All Australia and many more. Also, be sure and catch live coverage of special events and special broadcasts from the Unex Network. That's great. I'm going to subscribe to the Unex Network channel right now. Awesome. You can find everything you need to know about the YouTube channel at unexnetwork.com. That's unexnetwork.com. It's your one-stop shop for everything unexplained. It's the new mainstream. It's the Unex Network. Explaining the unexplained. The new unexnetwork.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Gold loves chaos. 
uncertainty and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. topic in general as a result of your experience. But before 1980, were you knowledgeable in the UFO topics or were you thrown into the deep end on the topic? I was not knowledgeable whatsoever. I was a young kid having a good time in life. Um, even after the event, I didn't. I mean, what I maybe did differently if we had the technology available to us today back in 1980, would I have probably went on the net and started looking at stuff? Probably. But there was no really way to do it. And we weren't really supposed to talk to, about it. And we weren't supposed to talk to each other about it. So, therefore, I let it go. And I really didn't dig deep into this until we were coming up on the 40th anniversary. And that was before I got really sick. And at that point, all the stuff that was going on, the fighting and everything, it was kind of like maybe we could all get together and solve the problems that we we're having with each other based off of misinformation, different things, and maybe we could get together. Well, Colonel Halt was all for it as long as certain people weren't going to be allowed involved. And, well, that was some of the problem. We needed to figure out what their involvement was and what we could figure out from their stories. So it never really happened other than we did go back over for the 40th with the film crew and they filmed it. Um, we did a conference over there and right after I returned is when I got sick. And that's when I really started digging. So up until the 40 year mark, I didn't pay much attention to it. I would do some interviews talking about what I remember happened to me and what went on with the whole event. But I, I didn't dig, start digging deep in until after 10, especially after I was sick and the fact the government was denying it. I was even involved. That's very interesting. So did researching UFOs bring closure, answers, or more questions? It never ends. In 1988, I agreed to do the hypnosis. Man, you know, like, well, how do you explain this? And where do you go with this? And I made sure it was kept locked down, but there was nobody. See, you can't talk to people about this. And what I mean by you can't, is that I'm not trying to bag on anybody, but 
talking to a believer isn't going to get you anywhere. Talking to a, a, a person that doesn't believe isn't going to get you anywhere. So you, to talk to people, you, there's a fine group of people that, A, you can run stuff by that have some knowledge in different technologies and stuff and different things. But B, that you can trust where you can speculate and talk about things and dig deeper because the, sometimes when you talk to somebody, next thing you know, they're running their mouth saying that this is what you believe. And it's not necessarily what you believe. It's like you're looking for an explanation. It's just like the book, Weaponizations of a UAP, we everything in that book that we did has to do with documents that are declassified by the government to support what was being researched and worked on outside the back gate at Woodbridge during our event and the advancement of technology from this to include um, the fact that they were down there actually researching the UAP when our event took place, who there's a guy by the name of Pike that was working on a contract that was down there investigating what a UAP was. And they were actually, according to him, testing and provoking the UAP during the time we were out there. Let's hone in on that and the book that you just mentioned. Why did you write it four decades later? What new details are there that you found over the years? All the stuff, all the stuff. Like, for example, I wish I had a dollar for every time I've heard somebody say, well, what I saw, I can't explain, you know, being us. And you're kind of like, that's how I felt when I left that field. But when you go back, and you start researching technology and the area and what was located there, what they were testing, what the British government and the American government were working on, Marconi and stuff. There are declassified documents and stuff that can explain some of what we were dealing with and what we saw. Um, never mind the fact that condign supports of the UAP can affect what you remember, how you remember it, what you were seeing. And then frequencies themselves, whether they're from a UAP, whatever that is, and what the government's working on can affect your mind and how you perceive it and what you're doing. It's just kind of like what the pilots, those fighter pilots saw and different things. So the book itself is supported off of declassified documents and, and, and different projects that are were going on at the time and then moved forward. There's no speculation as far as these projects exist and in it, it shows how the things that we saw could be affected by what we were working on at the time to include, I met a guy one time in DC, he was a radar operator and he was in straight line radar and he came up to me and was talking to me and he says, you know, some of the very things you described, we had happened to us when we were running straight line radar. He said, this is before we had all the protection in place and his whole crew died of cancer and he was in remission. He said, so, you have to wonder what kind of frequencies our straight line radar has that the same thing you are encountering with. So there's a lot of stuff out there that we uncovered that help explain some of what we could have seen happen. Never mind the fact that there clearly is something there. It's still there to this day. And the government was working on trying to understand it at the time of our event. What would you like to say to those UFO skeptics who believe the sightings were caused by a meteor or atmospheric distortions or the nearby or Fordness lighthouse? Oh, I've, I've, I've dumped on them pretty hard over the years. Um, it just, okay, one of the guys in the book, his name's David Clark, who just exposed the uh, picture of that whatever event happened. I, freak, I can't think of the name of it now. It just came out in the last three days. But even he who was very skeptical after listening to Jenny Randalls, who was involved in it early on, the investigation, myself, the research that James Warrow did and, and brought forward um, as far as all the possibilities of the technology we're working on, totally believes that something's going on with the government. And they are working on some kind of exotic technology. He's just not gone as far as whether or not any of it has to do with something you know, else. And I, I'm still telling you, I don't know what a UAP is, other than it appears to be some kind of energy form that, according to Condine's intelligent, is able to do things and it exists. 
In 2014, you co-authored the book Encounter in Rendlesham Forest, written with Jim Penniston and Nick Pope. What are the contrasts between this book and the book you wrote in 2020? Well, 2014 was a vanilla book. It um, it described the base, the event, and, you know, in general terms. Um, barely co- talked about Condine. Um, Pope didn't want to go into it. He claimed that down the road would be the time to do it, not in the book, which is one of the things that upset me because we had evidence that the government, British government, was aware that we were exposed to UAP radiation, whatever that is, um, and that <coughs> he didn't want to pursue Condon very hard. And so it was just a general <coughs> book on what happened in you know, some of the people that were there and what took place. The book I wrote in 2020 was done for two reasons. Number one, it laid out all the possibilities of what was in the area, what was going on, and what could have affected us. But it was also a message to those that I've dealt with, including some people like, just the people that I've been dealing with on this, that I'm not going to be their poster boy. I'm not going to go to D.C. and sit there and say I was injured by UP, UAP that's dangerous, that, you know, that we can't trust that we've got to muster the troops, you know, whatever. I'm I, I, I'm a person that believes in research and the evidence is in front of you. And that's why even though people attack me to this day, I don't know what a UAP is. I, I can give you some summary of what I think it is based off Condine the projects we've worked on, the advancements in technology. But ultimately, I can't tell you where it's from or it, does it exist on Earth? Is it interdimensional for you know, for real or anything else? But I do know whatever it is, is something they're looking on to work on counter countermeasures um, like warp drive and the ability to cloak. And all this is going on. And I'm not making this so people like, what? This is Star Trek. No, it's real. All you got to do is go to the different government sites and you'll see they're working on R&D and all this. Never mind that the, I don't know how many, 50 DIA papers that were presented to Senator McCain, which is interesting enough is when I got my settlement through him, they immediately, these people that had been in government and were contractors that were working on exact technology, immediately went to his committee to brief him further on what they had available, what they could work on and the funding they would need to make it work. I don't think a lot of people know what UAPs are, but they're scared to admit that. So while we're mentioning Nick Pope, I interviewed him in a previous episode of this show and was surprised about how candid he was. Although we didn't talk too much about the Rendlesham encounters, how would you rate your interactions with him in a sense of him being open with you or holding back some information he might have about the case? I, I guess I'm asking if you got the impression that he knows a lot more than he's letting on. Well, the problem with people that hide behind like national security, he uses the secret act, secrets act. Um, you have different people now that have come forward that are working on this with Congress. And anytime you get to a serious question, they can't talk about it because it's national security or the secrets act is you have no way. Number one, any of these people other than Mellon for sure, who you knew what his job was inside government. You have no way of knowing how much access they had to stuff, how much they know, nor do you know when they tell you they can't talk about it whether they really know or not so when it comes to mr pope mr pope has done a good job of creating a career off of this and when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of everything even condine he doesn't seem to want to talk about it very much and even the fact that i brought to his attention that he was in government getting out in six when condine was done and he claimed that he was involved with it Yet he never brought up the fact that Rendlesham existed in Condine until after I read it and brought it to his attention. So it's hard to say. I mean, it's just like with Penniston. It's hard to say how much of it is real memory, how much of it is hypnotic memory, and how much of it could it be just embellishment. I don't know. Same way with Nick and some of these other guys. You never know for sure because they have ways of 
covering their tails, as I call it. Well, you have stated that confirmation trumps disclosure. Disclosure is a passive process and contains little intellectual content. Can you please tell us about that and your viewpoint overall on the concept of disclosure? Well, basically, and it's changed a little bit since To the Stars came out and some stuff has come out. But ultimately, it started with uh, Bob Bigelow doing an interview with George Knapp. And he talked about how that we need to get it out to the public that something's going on. And we need to be very vague in what it is. And then we need to stop right there. And it, it was also implied that, you know, working through government to try to advance technologies. So what the gist of it is in my presentations I've done over the years and still talk about to this day is that's kind of where we're at. Um, people, how many times have you heard since 17 disclosures right around the corner, you know, and it's not. And what exactly would satisfy people for disclosure in the first place? You know, what's an, what is disclosure, but they've obviously through the videos they released through the Navy encounters, some of these other things that have taken place, we've confirmed something's going on. We've confirmed that the government's interested in it. I mean, you've got the hearings now, and everything else. But if you noticed, one of the things was when one of the questions that came up um, during that hearing was, have we developed technology off the phenomenon? And they said, we have to take that behind closed doors. They wouldn't elaborate even more. So, and I've spoken to people inside the Beltway about this, and they're looking at certain things. Um, but ultimately, you're going up against a national security state that's been going since the 40s. And and if you know the history of this field, there's been numerous times over the years where something like disclosure is going to happen at any moment, and it still hasn't to this day. So I I, hold, I don't hold my breath on any of this going forward, and I don't want to say that the people aren't genuinely behind a cause, but it's even sometimes hard to figure out exactly what that cause is because you can never get a straight answer for them when it comes to certain things because of national security. John, how would you define disclosure? What would be the smoking gun? Well, obviously, disclosure would be if whatever is there identifies itself and they can't cover it up. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like give an example, and I'm please, I'm sure people will attack me for this. But if you saw the movie Knowing, where these energy forms, they were in human form, they went to energy. If they showed up everywhere across the world at one point and everybody was seeing them and they were putting on the news, it'd be pretty hard to cover that up, even though I wonder if they would. But I guess the other point is, is that you'd have to have some confirmation from senior officials inside government that that is real, that, you know, that it's not like they've done so far where Congress says we want to know what we're dealing with. And they're not getting cooperation with all the military services to include the Air Force. For what I'm told, is still not cooperating whatsoever. But you'd have to get confirmation of some kind of documents released. And I guess probably the president of the United States coming on TV and addressing the world and the nation. Or it's possible there could be another foreign leader that could do it also. If he had enough compelling evidence that would change the way the world perceived. Well, we are now getting UAP hearings, and soon in the future, witnesses will be involved. What would you say if you were given the moment to speak to Congress on this? Well, it'd have to be, before I can answer that completely, would be what the mindset was when I, if I was brought up there and what they were looking for. Um, and I said a lot of how I feel in the book, but... Honestly, and this always people, the haters come out on this, but I, I this has been covered up for so long, and they they're very good at doing what they do. And whoever's behind the cover up, and what I mean by that is the national security state, because politicians come and go, is they're very good at this, and there's no reason, at least at this point that I'm aware of, for them to ever divulge what they really know or what they're working on off of this. You know, and I do believe that there's some good intentions 
in Congress to understand this, but at the same time, how far do they want to go if, if it's proven to them on the guidelines of national security? How far do they really want to go with the public knowing over what they can glean from this and gain from it themselves? John, we only have a few minutes left, so I have one more question for you. And I'd like to find out your knowledge and opinion on the paranormal aspects of the UFO topic and maybe paranormal aspects of your experience during and after the encounters at Rendlesham. And if you need a, a reference point for this question, I would use Skinwalker Ranch as a suggestion or the Bridgewater Triangle where you have poltergeist activity, disembodied voices, cryptids, energy orbs, hitchhiker entities, etc. So what are your thoughts on that? Okay, you do understand that that if you are to believe what Con 9 says and the fact that I've been able to talk to different scientists and people that have been looking at this, that whatever we're dealing with, and that's what the government's interest in is frequencies and how frequencies affect the mind what you see, how you see it, how do you remember it? So when you talk about Skinwalker, I always wanted to go up there. And through the years, Bigelow, people would reach out to me. And I always tell them that two things. Number one, I have no intentions of talking to one of his cronies. Um, I will speak to him directly, and I want to do it as Skinwalker. Because I really wanted to go up there for myself just to take a look at what was being reported. But I can tell you this. And again, this will probably get blown out of proportion as far as mis misinterpreted. I lived in Sedona for two years. And while I was there, I met some people that were involved in with the Hopi Nation. Um, I had the privilege of being taken up there for some of their sacred dances. Um, my son got drawn into it um, after I went up there the first time. Um, I was taken to one site where no... I can say no white person was supposed to be allowed, but I was. It was one of the most sacred areas. And when I was leaving the dance area, uh, the guy I was with, the Hopi elder, we were encountered by a blue kachina dancer, and we were both handed roots. And he spoke to this dancer in Hopi, and he looked at me and he says, this is a big deal. He says, now you have to take this root and plant it in your backyard. So we finished the weekend. Um, we went back to Sedona. Uh, he dropped me off, went back down to the valley and called me about two, three hours later after I got home, said, have you planted the root yet? And I said, not yet. He says, go plant it. So I was trying to unwind from the whole weekend and just the whole thing that went on. So I went out and planted the root in the backyard. About 20 minutes after I did, I was back in another room and my son's screaming, there's something in his room. And there were all kinds of blue orbs in his room. And there was at one point a red orb trying to come through the wall. And it went after the red, the blue went after the red and drove it away. So at that point, I'm watching all this and then they disappeared. So I call this guy up right away and I go, all right, what the heck? you know, is going on here. What is going on? You know, what have you done? What are you, you know? And he goes, that's a sign. So I'm like, okay. He goes, now your son needs to come to help you. So they brought him up there and he was allowed to go to the rock and he was allowed to be around the rock where most people aren't. He was taken to their dances and he was treated like royalty. I don't know if you've ever seen the dances, but they do each dance at the end. They hand out different gifts and stuff. And at the very last dance, well, the second to last dance, have you ever seen a dance? I have. They have they're called jokers. Mm -hmm. And they're supposed to be time travelers. Well, they all came over and messed with me. So, but on the last dance, they all came over and every single gift they had was awarded to my son. So that was hard uh, could explain. And dealing with the elders up there is dealing with the government. They're not going to tell you. They just tell you it's a sign. And down the road, you'll understand. So that happened. 
when I was also in Sedona, we went out to an area over Bradshaw Ranch. And that particular night, it just went completely crazy with everything in the sky going around us and all this stuff that happened. And the interesting thing was that I can't go into detail who I was with other than this particular person was involved in a remote viewing program and basically took me out there to see what would happen and even made the comment towards the end when nothing happened in the first 15 or 20 minutes was normally you have to prepare for it by meditating. And about two minutes after that, all heck broke loose with everything that went on that night. So at that point afterwards, they said, well, the government's going to be interested in you now. So, and they were. So, um, yes, I've had strange things happen, but again, I can't explain them. And I'm not going to. And I'm sorry if that annoys people, but I'm not an expert on this. I don't have access to anything more than what I've been able to find, you know, through digging and, and stuff and questions I've done in FOIAs. But I can tell you this, there's something going on. And is what exactly it is, I don't know, because partly if what they're telling us is true in these documents, what we're seeing may not be really what it is anyway. As they say, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. This was a great way to end today's show. John Burroughs, thank you so much for being on Shifting the Paradigm. Where can people find you online? Um, I've kind of uh, taken a hiatus because... Um, without I'm kind of giving the, 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 the thing away because I am kind of war working with behind the scenes with some of this stuff through the government. I'm kind of just laying low right now and seeing how it plays out. And I, I'm really, this was a great interview because I didn't have to go into that other than to say that I've, I've actually done a little bit with them because I don't really want to go into it right now because I'm not sure what's going number one and number two. I've been asked not to really say much about it. So Right now I'm laying low, but I am on Facebook under my name, John F. Burles. So, and you can message me and I will answer you back. But as you started the show with, I'm a celebrity. No, I'm not. I'm just a guy that went out there doing his job that had some things happen to him that they can't explain it affected me health-wise also. It's still to this day. Like, how remember how contact it ended with she, her sitting there playing with the rocks, looking out, wondering what the hell really is going on? That's yeah. me to this day. I still don't have the answers. And I'm not going to lie to you. I don't think I'll ever will, but I sure would like to. Thank you so much. You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. To hear a witness talk about one of the most famous military documented UFO encounters of all time was an honor. I wish to thank John once again for being so generous with his time to speak with us. His social media links are in the description box below. Check out my website at strangeparadigms.com to catch all of the show archives in podcast and video formats, along with guest appearances and all of my social media links, such as Discord, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and more. Follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies to catch all of my updates and news. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. Please like this video or podcast on your platform of choice and share it with those who have the same interest. Subscribe if you haven't already, because there's a lot more great shows coming to you soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.